you. I am delighted to be here today, and thank you, Marlon, for that really lovely introduction. Um, I think, you know, a few years ago, it would have been really odd for a transportation planner to be doing a talk on travel and health. You know, transportation planners thought about the economy, and we thought about the environment, but we weren't thinking about health. Uh, that all changed uh, about 10 years ago or so. You all heard from Jim Salas a couple of weeks ago, who I think is really one of the critical people who brought planning and public health uh, back together. Um, so it's just, it's been a, a, you know, a great experience to interact with this other community and think about how um, the kinds of questions we're interested in very much overlap with the kinds of questions uh, that the public health field has, and then sort of putting our heads together about how do we solve all of these problems. So I'm going to talk about travel and health, and I just realized that I had given a slightly different title back when I first agreed to talk. So on the flyer, I think it says walking and biking and health. Uh, so my talk is actually going to be a little more general than that, though I will spend some time talking about bicycling uh, in particular. Um, so the, the connection between, between travel and health has always been there, of course. It's just that it's only more recently that we've really started to think about this uh, in a conscious way. Uh, the World Health Organization, among others, has uh, identified this as a really critical link. Um, so, so they talk about promoting healthy and sustainable transport alternatives to prevent the negative effects of transport patterns on human health. And there are many other health-related agencies that are also talking about the importance of transportation policy from the standpoint of health. Um, in general, the, the, the concerns fall into three, three broad categories. So the first one is, of course, safety. And this is something we have been thinking about for many decades, uh, although I don't think we always talked about it with respect to health uh, specifically. Uh, the second one is pollution, and air pollution in particular, and you here in LA know that we've been worrying about this for a long time, uh, again, from a health standpoint. And then more recently, of course, is the concern over low levels of physical activity, and in particular, their connection to the obesity epidemic, but to other health issues uh, as well. So what I want to do with the time I've got is talk a little bit about um, these, each of these sets of problems and then take a look at the solutions. And as a travel behavior researcher, I look at these problems and these solutions from a travel behavior standpoint. So what I'm going to focus on are the kind of choices that we make uh, with respect to our daily travel. So whether or not to travel on a particular day, what mode of travel, where to go, when to go, all of these decisions we're making on a daily basis um, that, as it turns out, affect our own health uh, because they influence our exposure to crashes, our exposure to pollutants, they influence our levels of physical activity. Um, but of course, these choices also affect the health of others, so I want to talk about that as well. Uh, our choices affect the risk of crashes for other people, the level of pollutants, that everybody else breathes, uh, the quality of the bicycle and pedestrian environment. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about these, these um, problems and these solutions from this standpoint, from the standpoint of travel behavior and these choices that we're, that we're making. Uh, I will note, you know, I think we don't do a particularly good job about thinking about how these choices affect our own health. Um, and we do an even worse job of thinking about how these choices affect other people's health. Uh, so I hope to sort of highlight some of these, these connections today. Okay, so the first concern, traffic safety. Um, you know, the numbers are really stunning in a not positive way. Uh, 1.2 million people worldwide uh, die in traffic crashes each year. Uh, the problem is worse in low and middle income countries. But even in high-income countries, uh, people are dying at a rate of 10.3 per, per 100,000 per year. You know, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal problem. Um, uh, road traffic injury was the ninth leading cause of death in the world in 2004. We all know this is a really significant problem. Um, now, what about the choices that we make that influence safety? So thinking about our own safety, 
That's influenced by how much we choose to travel, what modes we use to travel by, uh, if we're driving, what kind of facilities we drive on, how fast we drive, what time of day we travel. All of these choices influence our, um, our own safety. Uh, being a driver or a passenger in a car, as it turns out, is not the most risky mode on a per mile of travel basis. Uh, that honor goes to motorcycles, maybe not surprisingly, followed by walking and bicycling, also significantly higher um, death rates and injury rates on a per mile basis. Uh, but of course the reason, a lot of the reason that these other modes are um, riskier than driving is because of how people are driving and how that affects the motorcyclists and the bicyclists and the pedestrians. So think about all of the, the choices we make about our driving that impact uh, the safety of others. So how much we drive, how fast we drive, how aggressively, distractions while driving, uh, fatigue, uh, choices about our vehicles, you know, what kind of vehicles we choose to drive, how well we maintain them, intoxication, of course, uh, another important factor. Um, it's important to point out that the distribution of these risks are not perfectly equal. Uh, and one thing I want to point out in particular is that people who are more dependent on walking and biking uh, are also people who are more at risk. So the young and the elderly who are less able to drive than the rest of us also have uh, more limited abilities that makes walking and biking more risky for them even though they are more dependent on it. Uh, lower income households also more dependent on walking and biking. Uh, they tend to live in areas that are more hazardous for walking and biking. So we have sort of this catch-22 that the people who need to walk and bike more also face greater risks with respect to walking and biking. Okay, second concern, air pollution. Uh, again, you, you probably are all familiar with this, but air pollution affects uh, our lungs uh, and our ability, the ability of our lungs to do what they're supposed to do. Uh, it contributes to respiratory diseases. Uh, it affects the heart and the circulatory system. And according to the World Health Organization, air pollution contributes to, or in fact causes, 1.3 million deaths worldwide each year. So a very significant health, health problem. Uh, in the U.S., we have federal standards about certain pollutants. And these standards are set based on health considerations. Um, cars are not the only sources of these pollutants, but they are a very major source of these pollutants. So our driving is contributing to the problem. Um, we make travel choices that affect our own exposure to these pollutants. So for example, whether you, if you take a car or a bus, you get higher exposures to certain kinds of pollutants. If you go by bus or subway, you get higher exposure to other kinds of pollutants. Um, if you walk or bicycle, your exposure levels are less because you're farther away from the vehicles. Now remember, if you're, when you're driving in your car, you are not protected from the emissions. You are actually breathing lots of that stuff that's out there on the road. So a bicycle a pedestrian, if they're, they're a little bit farther away from vehicles, the uh, concentration levels are lower. But of course, if you're walking or biking, you may be breathing harder. And because those modes are slower, you're out there for longer. So it, the, the health impacts may be just as significant, if not uh, more significant. Uh, the choices we make about driving are affecting the uh, concentrations of pollutants out there and thus everybody else, else's health as well as our own health. So again, the more driving that we do, if we're doing more idling, faster acceleration, sort of the extreme speeds, higher or lower speeds mean more emissions. Uh, whether we use con cruise control and overdrive, and again, our vehicles, how well our engines are tuned, our tire inflation. All of these choices we're making are affecting the levels of these pollutants. Uh, again, the distribution is not perfectly equitable. Uh, some populations are more susceptible to the effects of air pollution, so infants, children, pregnant women, those with uh, lung and heart diseases are more affected by these pollutants. Uh, but also populations, uh, certain populations have greater exposure to, the, to these pollutants 
and in particular, who tends to live near freeways where the concentrations of these pollutants are greater, it tends to be lower income households. So the, the health effects are not equitably distributed. There are, of course, other forms of, of pollution that we could talk about, water pollution, noise pollution, both of which have also significant health effects. Uh, they've gotten a little less attention or at least less visible attention in the policy world, uh, but are, are, are also important um, connections between travel and health that we need to uh, consider. And then, of course, if you think about the life cycle of the automobile from its uh, you know, its manufacture through its use to its disposal, um, you know, we could find a, a whole bunch more environmental impacts uh, that could also have health impacts that we would want to take into account. Okay, and then the third concern uh, is a little different, and this is the, the newer one. As I said, maybe about 10 years or so now, uh, we've been thinking about this connection between transportation and physical activity. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends two hours, 30 minutes of moderate physical activity per week for adults, so 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Uh, over 35% of American adults do not meet these recommendations. Uh, I was surprised it was this low. I thought it was actually a higher percent that is not meeting these recommendations. Maybe it's gotten worse. Um, and this physical inactivity, of course, has important implications for health. So physical inactivity is cited as the fourth leading risk factor for mortality worldwide, uh, responsible for 6% of deaths. So again, a very significant health issue that's tied to, tied to travel. Now the, you know, the most important travel choice we make with respect to physical activity is our mode of travel. So we talk about the active modes of transportation or active travel. I don't know if Jim used that term when he was here. Uh, we transportation planners tend to call it non-motorized travel, but the public health community likes to talk about it as active travel. Uh, so walking, biking, the obvious um, modes of active travel. But transit also gets included in there uh, in a lot of cases, and that's because getting to and from the bus, we tend to be more active than when we just drive somewhere. Uh, now, if you drive to transit and you get right on the train, you're not getting a lot of physical activity. But if you're walking or taking your bike to get to or from the train, then, you know, then there is some element of physical activity to your travel. Uh, so we tend to put all three of these into that category. Now, you know, what you see on this graph is uh, down there at the bottom is the USA uh, with the lowest share of active travel of any of these other uh, countries with similar sorts of economies uh, to ours. So we are not doing very well on this, this account. Uh, again, we got to think about the, the equity um, aspects of this, the distributional aspects of this, uh, and it ties back to the safety question in that uh, the, the segments of the population uh, who may be in most need of increased physical activity and could most benefit from increased active travel are also those populations that have greater safety risk when they're walking or bicycling. So this is, you know, this is a challenge uh, for us planners. Walking and biking to school, I don't know if you've seen these statistics. How many of you walked or biked to school? Yeah, well that's pretty good. It's better than the US average. By far the majority of kids in this country are getting driven uh, to school rather than walking and biking themselves. And so there's been a lot of attention to this issue and the whole Safe Routes to School movement to try and get kids uh, to walk and bike again as a way of increasing their physical activity, particularly as obesity levels among uh, children are increasing. So we need more, more active travel. Um, we, we could, for ourselves, be choosing more active travel. Uh, the other thing I want to point out, again, is that our choices about our own travel influence other people as well and their, their health. Um, more walking and biking, the more walking and biking that I do, the better walking and biking is for the rest of you uh, in some different ways. One way is this idea of safety in numbers, that the more people who are out there walking and biking, the safer it becomes. You have more people on the street, the drivers are more aware 
of the bicyclists and pedestrians. Uh, the more people who are walking and biking, the easier it is to get political support to invest in walking and bicycling infrastructure. Uh, so there's that feedback as well. And then something we're particularly interested in in our work in Davis on bicycling that I'll talk about in a minute is, you know, the more that you see people walking and biking, the more you feel like it's a normal thing to do, a socially normal thing to do. Uh, so that helps to improve the, the environment as well. And then, of course, if we're choosing to drive instead of walk or bike, uh, that's making walking and bike, bicycling less attractive for everybody else in all kinds of ways, you know, the pollutants and the safety issue, and it's just a much less pleasant thing to do if you have lots of cars all over the place. So again, our choices are affecting our own health, but they're also affecting uh, the health of others. The safety in numbers uh, idea, there's data, uh, you know, from different countries showing the cycling fatality rates. So this is on a per kilometer basis. And you can see in places where there is a lot of bicycling going on, Denmark and the Netherlands in particular, it's a much safer thing. The fatality rates are much lower than they are in the US where we have far less, far less bicycling. Um, so there's good evidence to support this idea of safety in numbers. Now the, uh, the little corollary uh, to this concern over physical activity is physical inactivity. Uh, it turns out that sedentary activities, of which driving is surely one, uh, have, an, have negative impacts on health beyond simply the health effects of a lack of physical activity. Now, I don't know what you're doing if you're, if you're not being physically activity, active and you're not being sedentary. Maybe it's like what I'm doing now. <laughs> anyway, if I were sitting like you all are, that would be even worse for your, your health. So driving is bad not only because we're not walking and biking, but because we are sitting. So there are studies that show health effects of driving itself. So you know, there's a kind of a national level study that shows uh, what happens to the overall uh, obesity, national obesity rate for adults for every additional mile of travel uh, per licensed driver. Uh, another study that looked at the individual level that for each additional hour of driving per day, the odds of being overweight increased by 6%. Um, so there's some effect there as well. So in other words, if you walk and bike instead of driving, you're getting a double benefit, du double health benefit. Okay, so that brings us to the question about how do we go about improving the healthiness of travel? And uh, I sort of group the, the strategies or solutions into, again, three, three categories. So we can talk about reducing uh, the harm that driving does when we do drive. And I won't say a lot about that one. Um, the second thing we can do is reduce how much people actually drive. Uh, and we can talk about increasing active travel, in increasing how much people walk uh, and bicycle. So, um, I'm going to say just a, a couple of things about, oh, let's see, before I do that. So, of course, you know, how this overlays with the problems looks something like this. You know, it's pretty straightforward. If we, uh, you know, if we focus on reducing the harms of driving and reducing driving, what we're doing is lowering the risk of crashes, and we're reducing emissions, and all of that is good for health. Uh, if we're t trying to increase active travel, then that would lead to an increase in physical activity, which is a good thing for health. So that's all very straightforward. Uh, but there are some indirect connections as well that I think are important. So, um, uh, you know, if we're reducing the, the, the harms of driving and reducing driving, we are also helping to improve conditions for active travel, which should help to increase the amount of active travel that people are doing. And similarly, if we uh, focus on increasing active travel, uh, that can improve safety. And as long as that active travel is replacing driving, we're also helping to reduce, uh, reduce emissions. So in other words, there, there are a lot of synergies uh, in these different approaches in terms of the three different categories of health, health concerns. And in fact, when you think about it, there, you know, there's synergies not just sort of within this matrix, but also with other objectives we're trying to achieve, like 
uh, helping the economy, improving the environment, uh, addressing equity issues as well. So that's a good thing. It means we can be sort of taking on these health issues as a part of or in conjunction with um, a lot of these other sustainability-oriented efforts that we're, all of these things are sort of working in that, that same direction. And I'll come back to that at the, uh, at the end. Okay, so just a couple quick words about reducing the harms of driving. Um, you know, this is about vehicles and vehicle technology, and a lot of my colleagues at UC Davis focus on this question. It's about drivers and how they drive, how do we change driver behavior, a lot of those choices that I outlined before. Um, there are a lot of people out there doing research on that, on sort of the human factors question. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that. But the roads thing is interesting too. You know, we can reduce the harms of driving in part by how we design our roads. And there's sort of this interesting road design conundrum, if you will, about how best to do this. And what we've done traditionally is what you see on the left, which is make our roads you know, wider, straighter, smoother, fewer obstacles, so that we are reducing the risk that anybody's going to crash into anything. Uh, but what does that do? That creates roads where people tend to go faster, which has its own safety implications. Um, Increasingly, people, some planners, some advocates are arguing for uh, taking the approach on the right, where instead of trying to make faster, straighter roads, we say, okay, you know, they're gonna be, there's going to be some crash risk if we have trees next to the road and we let people park in the street, but people will drive more slowly there. So in fact, the safety risk is not any greater and is maybe even less in the situation on the right. And it's certainly a better environment for anybody who's not in a car. Okay, so we, we've had these, we have these sort of trade-offs. And um, historically, uh, you know, we've, we've made some different choices about how to address those trade-offs. So that's, uh, I mean, we could talk a lot about that, but I think that's a very interesting part of this. Okay, so then back to the other two uh, categories of, of strategies or solutions, reducing driving, increasing active travel. Uh, obviously, these two things are linked. So, you know, one way we can reduce driving is by getting people to walk and bike, right? So that's a connection. Uh, but there is this also this possibility that by focusing on reducing driving, we may end up reducing travel, travel by any means, right? Travel as a whole, uh, which can be good and which can be bad. And I'll come back to that briefly later on. Uh, and then, of course, the connections work the other way. So increasing active travel can be a way to help get people out of their cars. Um, but sometimes we find that when we're, we, we try and increase active travel, it doesn't necessarily mean somebody's driving less, but they're doing more travel as a whole. So that's a perfectly fine thing. And from a health standpoint, that's, that's great. As long as they're walking and biking, more travel is a great thing but it's not necessarily taking care of the, the driving problem in all cases. A uh, little travel behavior 101 before I start talking about some of the specific strategies. Um, we travel behavior researchers tend to draw on economic theory and I think Genevieve is gonna approach it from a more psychological standpoint a little bit. Uh, but in short, you know, we make choices that maximize our utility. In other words, you know, the choices that give us the most benefit, that make us happiest or whatever. Uh, and what's important in how we make our choices is the relative utility. So we're going to look at you know, the utility of driving versus the utility of walking and biking and pick the one that gives us the greatest utility. So from a policy standpoint, that's important because if what we want to do is change the choices that people are making, we've got to change these relative utilities. We've got to make driving less attractive, reduce its utility, We've got to make active travel more attractive. We've got to increase its utility. And probably we've got to do both of these things to see any really significant change. You couldn't just focus on one or the other. It wouldn't be enough of a change uh, to get much change in behavior. So then let's talk about how to do that. How do we make driving less attractive? How do we make uh, active travel more, more attractive? Well, you know, talking about reducing driving, uh, it's a daunting task when you look at this 
steady trend over many decades towards more driving on a per capita basis. This is not just overall, this is on a per capita basis. There's a little bit of hope here at the end and the fact that if you, if you take it out a couple of more years, uh, the trend stays relatively flat, suggesting that uh, you know, maybe our driving isn't going to continue to increase the way it has in the past and there's some debate about whether, whether it's going to stay like that or turn down or go up. But anyway, there's a little bit of hope there that maybe we can start to sort of cap how much driving is going on. And then here's, uh, here, here's how I think about it, the, the challenge, how we're going to meet this challenge. What do we have to do uh, to get people to drive less? So the first step uh, is to make it possible for people to drive less. I mean, I think if, if a lot of you think about your life here in Southern California, how many of you feel like you're pretty dependent on driving? This is not a representative sample, of course, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so would it be possible for you to drive less? And a lot of you might say, well, maybe a little bit, but really no. You know, I really don't have a choice. It's just, you know, the options aren't there. So we've got to design our communities to make it possible for people to drive less is the first step. And the pieces to this, um, which is a whole other lecture, you know, putting people close to the places they need to go, having destinations close by, proximity. It's connectivity, making sure that people have good, direct, safe connections to where they need to go, particularly for <coughs> the alternative modes like walking, biking, transit. So this is planning. You know, this is where urban planning is really important to help. You know, we can create these, these alternatives to driving through good and better planning. Uh, the second step, I think, is that we've got to help people see how they can drive less. I think it was Genevieve you were talking about, or Bianca, how there's this new rail line that nobody knows about, right? So, you know, people need knowledge about the alternatives, and we're getting better about making sure that people have the knowledge about the alternatives, but that's, sometimes they exist and people just, just don't know it. And then I put training up here as well, because sometimes even when you do know about the options, um, you don't know how to do it. Whether that's riding a bike or, you know, how to navigate the, the transit system and figure out how to get from this point to that point. So that's the second step, is you gotta, you gotta help people see how they can drive less. Um, the third step then, once they've got the option, they can see how it's possible to drive less, you gotta make them want it. Okay, and that's where you can do the carrot or the stick, right? We have different ways to make people wanna, wanna change their behavior. You can make it harder to drive. And one way we do that is through pricing. Uh, that's the London congestion pricing scheme. We've got some road pricing in this part of the country that Marlon was lecturing about a little bit earlier. Uh, we can make it more expensive to drive. And in particular, we can make the uh, you know, the more harmful driving more expensive. Uh, and then in some cases, it's outright restrictions. You know, we have, you know, maybe parts of the city where we say these are not, you know, vehicles don't go here. We're going to reserve this for transit and, and bikes and pedestrians. So making it harder to drive. Uh, but then there's the carrot approach, uh, which maybe is a little nicer and an easier sell, although maybe less effective, is making it cooler to drive less, if you will, or making it, you know, just more desirable to drive less, to make people really want that. So there have been some interesting attempts at this, like, you know, making buses a lot cooler, hipper uh, than we think of a typical bus, uh, social marketing campaigns to try and get people to think about, um, you know, walking, biking. This is a good thing to do. It's a cool thing to do. Okay, so all of that, I think, has to happen if we want to get people to drive less. We've got to make it possible. We've got to help people see how it can be done, and we've got to help people want to do it. Um, that's all really, really hard to do. Uh, Marlon and I have a project with the California Air Resources Board at the moment where we're looking at the evidence out there on the effectiveness of all of these different sorts of possible strategies for reducing how much people drive, and for one, the evidence is a little thin, uh, unfortunately, and for two, where there is evidence, you know, the effects are pretty small. 
you do any one of these things and you don't see a lot of impact on how much people are driving. So it's pretty clear we've got to do a whole bunch of things if we're going to change people's behavior. And not only that, you know, even if we figure out this is what needs to be done, you've got to be able to do it politically and institutionally. So it's not just changing individual behavior, but it's also changing that institutional behavior that has given us this very automobile oriented system that we've, that we've got. So it's, it's really not as simple as I uh, just made it, made it sound. Uh, caveat about trying to reduce driving. Um, we also know that travel has many positive benefits. Um, there's research that shows a connection between vacation travel, for example, and well-being. So when we talk about reducing driving, we want to be careful about that and make sure we're focusing on reducing the, the less healthy driving, like being stuck in the traffic jam on the 405, uh, and not uh, uh, reducing the, the kind of travel uh, that brings us health and well-being uh, benefits. Okay, then uh, increasing active travel, uh, the, the third leg of this. So I'm going to ignore transit for now. We can come back to it in the discussion if anybody's interested, but most of my work is focused on, on non-motorized travel, so walking and biking. And Often those two things get lumped together. We talk about active travel, non-motorized travel. Bike ped is another abbreviation for this. In the data, they're often lumped together. But really, they're very different things. And the way I like to think about it is walking has much greater people potential because most people are able to do it. You don't need any extra equipment to do it, anything like that. Uh, but it's got less trip potential because it's much slower. So there are not very many trips we can make on foot, you know, unless we live in Manhattan where everything is, you know, is right there. Um, bicycling, in contrast, has less people potential because you have to have a bike, obviously, uh, but also an ability and a comfort with bicycling, uh, which a, a large seg a segment of the population does not have. Um, but the nice thing about bicycling is that it's got a lot more trip potential because it, obviously it's, it's faster. So there are a lot more destinations you can reach by bike uh, than you could by walking. So I've been focusing a lot on biking uh, uh, of late uh, for that reason, because I think it really does have some important uh, transportation potential, and because I live in Davis, where, of course, you have to bicycle. So I'll talk about Davis in a minute. But if you just look at the, um, the, our, our patterns of travel, um, a really surprising share of our trips are really short. 40% of the daily, you know, the daily trips we're making uh, to get to work or the store or whatever, 40% uh, are under two miles, which is definitely bicycling distance and, you know, maybe even walking distance. So there is a lot of potential out there if we, if we uh, give people the right conditions. Uh, you, again, you look at how we stack up versus everybody else on bicycling in particular and it's a really tiny share of travel that people are doing. So uh, you can look at this glass half full, glass half empty. I like to look at this and say, hey, you know, that, that's another sign that we've got a whole bunch of potential. Uh, look, how, you know, look how much higher it is in these other countries. Uh, surely we can move closer to their levels of bicycling if we just do the right things. Uh, the other thing that's encouraging is that there are places in the U.S. where there is a significant amount of bicycling as a mode of transportation, not, not for recreation, but as a mode of transportation. And uh, not surprisingly, where you tend to find the highest levels are in smaller cities that have universities, and Davis being one of them. And Davis, in fact, has far more bicycling. Uh, this, is, this is the share of workers who usually commute to work by bicycle, which is the, you know, from the U.S. Census, and it's the one measure we have where we can compare uh, across cities, across years. Uh, and Davis has far more than anywhere else, as you can see, uh, which is why I love living there so much. All right, so let me just say a little bit about Davis, and uh, this is because I love talking about Davis, but also because I think it nicely illustrates both the potential of bicycling, but also the challenge uh, in getting more people to bicycle. So anybody been to Davis? Oh, quite a few of you. Okay, so you know it's perfectly flat. 
the weather's pretty good, gets a little hot in the summer, it's pretty compact, and we've got this fabulous bicycle system, off-street paths, uh, as well as on-street bike lanes. Uh, here are some of our off-street paths. Uh, you can see we've got great, um, these are a, a tunnel and a bridge over and under, under and over the freeway and the railroad tracks, really critical links. Uh, in the network. Um, the city has done some great things to make bicycling work for kids by putting in, again, a couple of critical links in the network. Uh, it's also really a part of the culture. So we've got all these great bike events uh, that go on. We do own the world's record for the longest single line of bicycles. <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, it's the Davis symbol is the penny farthing. We have a bike powered carousel. The, you know, this is the Davis minivan, we like to say. <laughs> There's the various rigs for pulling your kids around. Uh, so we have a lot of bicycling in Davis. The number on the left is the one I showed earlier. The, the other numbers come from various surveys that we've done, not surprisingly. Uh, students, faculty, staff traveling to the UC Davis campus use bicycles a lot. Uh, in another survey, we found that um, Davis residents, over 50% of Davis residents had bicycled at least once in the previous week. How many of you can say that? All right, good. Thank you. Okay, so we have a lot of bicycling. But you can look at it the glass half empty way as well and say, yeah, but there's a lot of not bicycling as well. Uh, so what's that about? You know, you've got almost perfect conditions there. Why aren't more people bicycling? Um, you know, even in Davis, kids are mostly getting driven to school. Uh, my daughter, that's my daughter's graph, she goes to the, went to the Spanish Immersion School, so kids are coming from all over town, so maybe they had an excuse, but you know, two kids out of her class were bicycling to school in Davis. You know, that's not good. So we've been doing a lot of research on this, and the thing we keep finding in our surveys is that, um, one of the strongest predictors of who's bicycling is agreement with the statement, I like riding a bike. So if you strongly agree with that statement, you bicycle twice as much as if you only agree with that statement. So the next thing we did was a bunch of interviews to try and understand this better. Where does this come from? Why do some people strongly agree and other people only agree? And we, we haven't really found the answer. But again, we're finding these, you know, there's, there's some people who just really like it and really enjoy it. And we picked out all these happy quotes that sort of got at that idea. And we still don't know why these people say these kinds of things and other, other people don't. But I think what it means is that this idea of uh, the four E's of bicycle planning, if anybody's a planner, you may have heard this. Uh, this goes back quite a ways uh, that to uh, promote bicycling, we need to do good engineering. We need education, encouragement, and enforcement. Uh, we've tended to focus on the engineering. You know, building bike lanes, building bike paths, uh, that's where the money and the, you know, the political effort has gone. Uh, but I think the Davis example makes it really clear that it, you've, you've really got to do the education and especially the encouragement as well. Infrastructure is not enough. You've also got to change how people think uh, about active travel. The enforcement thing, I've got more questions about, but that, again, that's a whole nother, whole nother discussion. Okay, and then my caveat on the active travel side of things, um, you know, it's good to increase active travel. That's great from a health standpoint. It's even better if when you increase active travel, you are replacing driving. Uh, and it's not true that every new bike and pedestrian trip uh, that comes about because of, um, you know, the building of a new bicycle path necessarily replaces a driving trip. If you can do both, then you get, um, you know, you get that much more health benefit out of it. And this is a little extreme. <laughs> you know, most people don't move their couch on a bike. But, you know, the point being, it's not just about getting people on their bikes as a form of recreation. What we want to do is get them on their bikes as a mode of transportation and ideally as a replacement uh, for driving. And that's what gives you the greatest health benefit. Okay, so I think this is where I wrap up, just coming back to this question about how do we improve the healthiness of travel? We've got to think about reducing the harm that driving does when people do drive, because people are always going to be driving, uh, and that's a lot of technology question. We, we also need to think about reducing driving, 
you know, even if we get cleaner vehicles and all of that, there are good reasons why uh, the world would be better off if people were driving less. And we need to think about increasing, uh, increasing active travel. So technology is a big part of the, the solution, especially to the one on the left. Uh, but it's going to take really good planning as well. And in particular, I think it's going to take a shift in transportation planning and how we think about the transportation system. Um, so in the past, we focus all on let's make it easier to drive. Uh, but instead, and increasingly, we're thinking about it in terms of making better places. Uh, health is not necessarily the main motivation for this, but I think doing that uh, gives us all kinds of health benefits and uh, makes, for, makes for better communities. I'm going to bring up a few uh, slides here with just some thoughts. And um, my hope is that I can bring a slightly different uh, perspective uh, that will continue to add uh, to this, this uh, issue. As uh, Marlon mentioned, my, uh, I'm currently in the Department of Preventive Medicine over at the HSC campus across town. And my background is in psychology and public health. So I think about these things uh, from the individual level, these decision, uh, decisions that we make across the day about travel choices and physical activity, uh, as, as well as how our individual thoughts, emotions, and interact with the environment that we encounter. So it's these multi-level uh, approaches. And I want to uh, just reiterate a few points that Dr. Handy made that I, th I think that are, that are good to, for us to think about uh, as we move into this discussion. But um, one point that I think is really important that, that she said um, in the middle and then again at the end is that travel is, is important. There's a lot of benefits for our mental health, um, our well-being, our social interaction. We know being uh, housebound is, is, is not, not, neither not fun or, or good for us necessarily. Older adults who have a difficulty getting out of the house, shown through studies, don't, don't fare as well and, and many outcomes. So we don't, uh, this is a good point to move forward. We don't, we don't want to get, you know, say, well, the best solution is just keep everyone in their house. Well, that's not going not gonna to help. And I think this is challenging because depending on the geographic um, nature of any given city, sometimes you can, um, getting out of the house is good. But think of me, thinking about, it made me think about Southern California. We have a lot of different um, geographical features. We have mountains. We have the beach. These things are all spread. You know, the whole idea that you can ski one in the morning and surf in the afternoon is wonderful, but it's pretty hard to bike, walk, or take transit from one to the other. And, but that ability, I think, is what people what draws people to this area. And being able to cross um, uh, large distances can improve your quality of life and your well-being, but we, we as public health and planners need to think about how do we do that in a way um, so we, we don't want to discourage people from um, getting out and seeing things and enriching their lives, but how do we do that when there's not easy transit or any way to get from the mountains to the beach? Um, you can bike there, but it's, it's, you know, 50 miles is a long bike ride for a day, and, and some people do it, but not most of us. So um, that's an important point. Um, I, I want to reiterate, this is a point that um, I, uh, Dr. Handy didn't, I don't think she necessarily made it today, but in her, um, she has two, two great book chapters that came out and I had a chance to look over those before this talk. And one thing that really struck me was looking at these changes that have been made historically. It was the 1930s that we started to see attempts to improve the safety of driving, um, improve the safety of cars, car design, the safety of roads, putting in, um, thinking a lot about engineering. Um, both um, mechanical and, um, and in terms of uh, transportation road design and to reduce driving risk. Then 30 years later is when we started to see a lot of the environmental movements, the, the creation of the EPA, efforts to reduce air pollution, a lot of policies, um, uh, state and federal level to, to, cut those, um, to cut air pollution. And now 40, really 40 years later in the early 2000s is when we really started to see this trend that um, Dr. Handy is talking about to promote active travel and, um, and potential policies and programs to surround that. So it's interesting to think about the development historically over time. 
Um, another issue that came up in um, the book chapters, and this is an, a, an economic term, is the f a focus on externalities. So a, an, an externality in, a, in an economic model is the effect on, on other people, the effect of a choice or a behavior on other people. And I thought about this a lot when reading the, your chapter, and I thought, you know, I think often these choices, when we, when we hear about it, at least in more of a popular um, media, popular um, literature type of a, a perspective, we think about, am I going to, if I choose to get a hybrid car, or if I choose to bike or walk, it's, it's um, I'm going to have to sacrifice something. It's me versus the greater good of society. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna um, bike, it's because I don't, wanna, I don't wanna contribute to air pollution that affects everybody else. So it's me versus um, everybody else, and often, unfortunately, we choose us. You know, we choose, well, that's great. I, I really do care about the environment, but I, you know, it's just, a, it's really hard for me and I don't, to, to bike or walk. I'd, maybe somebody else will do it, and then they'll, we'll save the, you know, it'll, the, we'll save the environment. But I think by this, the, by this third leg, focusing on health, it's not just me versus society, uh, that choice. It's me versus me, <laughs> my own health and society. And I think that that, you know, if, we, if there's a way to harness that a little bit more. And I, th you know, I think that often we think if I, you know, just making that choice, this is about your own health too. This is about your health if you choose to walk or bike um, and get, or drive a, get a hybrid car or drive less and health of everybody else. So that, that's an interesting thing just to maybe we can think about, maybe we can talk about a little bit more later. And um, kind of the last point to re reiterate from Dr. Handy's talk is the, um, this is really the four E's that she was talking about. That, and, and, and you know, from in public health we talk about these in terms of multi-level um, interventions, the social ecological model, that to change behavior, we really need to address multiple levels of contextual analysis, which means we need to change in the environment or policy, but that always isn't enough, as we know, and the whole, if you build it, will they come, that, you know, that they may not come, that we also need to address at the individual level in terms of education and programming awareness. Um, you can build all the great biking infrastructure, but if, if you don't, if, if people don't really know about it, or you can put in all this great public transit, people don't know about it, um, or feel, even if they know about it, did they feel compelled or motivated to use it? So it's addressing, uh, intervening on multiple levels, which most of you are probably very, very familiar with. So I wanted to bring, so being a, a, a psych, uh, I don't want to come as a psychologist because I don't sit down and I'm not, I'm not going to you know, do therapy, but I do have that background. So I, we think about the, the individual level. Now this is, this is um, a, a good friend and colleague, Mariella Alfonso's model that she um, worked up, but I thought it might be interesting to think about in terms, in the context of Dr. Handy's talk. Um, Mariella was a graduate student of, of Marlin's, um, and she um, developed a conceptual model which if any of you have taken a psych course, this is based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which, which is a motivational model to describe why people do anything that they do. And this is why, to describe why people are mo would be motivated or make choices to walk, um, and to maybe potentially to walk um, versus drive. And the, the idea that, that, that the bottom rung of the pyramid um, says that um, th those needs at the bottom lower levels need to be met before the higher needs can be met. So in this case, feasibility. Um, feasibility is really, in this case, about the distance between desti to, to a destination or the time you have. If, that's, if, it's, if you don't have enough time, if you need to be there in five minutes because something's going to start, it doesn't matter. You know, your choice is going to be, I got to get in the car and drive it. I'm, I'm late. Um, so if that's not met, if it's not feasible, you, don't, you didn't give yourself enough time, or you don't have enough time, or if it's too far, you're not going to get to the next step. And so um, from there, get up. So if that's met, it's feasible, then you might ask yourself, is it accessible? Are there trails that I can get to? Are there um, bike, bike lanes in the road? Are there, um, is there a place to cross the street, or do I have to walk way around? And that would take, you know, that's a whole um, long distance, you know, just to get across the street. If that's the case, then you might go and say, is it safe? Um, safety from crime, safety from traffic. And you know, theoretically, then you would move up to the next level of getting to comfort and pleasurability. Those are the highest levels. Um, and um, that if, if the lower levels are met, so comfort and pleasurability talk a lot about um, 
maybe amenities on the on the on the way? Are there um, things that you might uh, benches you might sit on sit to, to rest on? Pleasurabilities about aesthetics. You know, just as planners and designers, you know, this is what you think about a lot too. You know, you know interesting things to look at. Um, uh, is, are there, is there vegetation and trees? So th it's just an interesting perspective I wanted you know, to share from um, Mario Alfonso, but that um, how does this apply to these travel, these utility models and travel choices that we make? Maybe you agree with this, maybe you don't. Maybe, um, maybe some people just jump right to pleasurability if, it, you know, if it's not feasible, but theor you know, theoretically the bottom rungs would need to be met before you could move up. Um, but but I, you know, I, I, maybe all of them at some point really need to be met. And how do we do that as, as planners and as public health uh, researchers? So I want to talk about a few discussion um, points that I think were interesting. I certainly don't know the answers to these. And they're just, <laughs> they're just questions. Some of them may be research questions or ideas for studies. But um, one thing we think about in public health um, are, you know, are trade offs between um, different behavioral choices. And in physical, from a physical activity research standpoint, we think a lot about the different domains of physical activity. And I, didn't, I don't have a diagram here, but really we think about um, activity as can be done for recreational or leisure purposes. This is, might be something you do for fun or maybe even going to the gym. Maybe some of you don't think that's fun, but it's during your recreation or leisure time. There's activity that you do for, that might be part of work. If you are on your feet, um, as part of a job, or maybe active, um, it may be in construction or doing some manual labor. That's another domain. Another domain is is transport. Um, so uh, there's uh, you know these overlapping domains, but the idea is that um, are there trade-offs when you do more of one? Are you doing less of the other for mo for many reasons? Maybe because you're just tired, you know? Because we you know if you walk, f I used to um, when I did my postdoc in DC, I'd walk. Four miles in <laughs> four miles a day, just in active transport. Two miles to get to and from the to, to get to work and then back, and um, I was tired at the end of the day. So to go after walking four miles and go do something else, which we, when we think about physical activity, there's benefits from walking, energy expenditure, but there's other benefits from other types of activity, whether they be strengthening, um, flexibility, you know, other muscle groups. So I might have those trade-offs were going on. Um, and then there's the idea, and I think about this a lot, when we think about um, the vo how, to what degree is um, a behavior voluntary, um, or how much volition is part of a behavior. And this really comes into play when we think about active travel, because some people travel by foot because they have no other choice. Maybe it's because of the cost of owning a car, or um, maybe it's just because um, the cost of operating a car, or whatever city that you live in. If you, but if you were instantly transplanted to a different place where it was more affordable or easier, that same person might buy a car. It's not that they're choosing to not, um, to not walk, to not drive. They just have to. And it, and this is from a psychological perspective. You know, this is interesting because the idea is that if we make using um, these, these some of these methods, um, maybe the 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 pushing the push methods with the prodding of the, the pitchfork behind somebody, if you make it more expensive or more restrictions. Um, and, and you get people to drive that, I mean, it's hard to drive less and to walk more, that could be really good for their health, but they may move and because they were put in this position where they really, maybe they didn't enjoy it at all, then when they have a choice, what happens? Is it gonna backfire on them? So just things we need to think about. And this is because we, there's more and more research in the realm of physical activity and um, that looks at the role of um, the reward response, enjoyment, this gets at, um, I like to ride a bike, <laughs> your question. Um, what is it about that? Some, you know, and, and that behavior, the more enjoyable a behavior is, it's thought to be more rewarding, it gives a, a, a feedback loop, the more likely you are to do it again um, if you have a choice. So how do we make it pleasurable and enjoyable if we take, if we reduce some of the vol voluntary nature of something because of our strategies? So just we have to keep that in mind. You can change behavior under certain conditions for a short period of time, and th but people move around, and then they make other choices. And if we, do, if we make it, s it, 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 we just have to think about the consequences. So these are just, these are, um, I said I don't know the answers to these questions, just ways to think about it. Um, the other thing that came up when I was um, preparing and thinking about this was the, the classic stigma that comes around 
biking and walking and public transit. And this is, it really varies where you are in the world, <laughs> really. Um, so I've tra traveled in China and in developing countries like China, and you've probably read and heard about that, you know, because the, the automobile is so new and it, it represents um, you know, a, a improvement in access and um, higher SES, and that if you have a car and you have a certain status that goes with that, and we see that more, um, you know, it, in, in very much so in developing countries, but also in, in the U.S. and in, in many places, you know, even in L.A., some, you know, some people riding the bus means you don't have any other way to get there? What's wrong, you know? Must mean you're poor or something, you know? And that, we know that that's not true. We know that we all, you know, there's people that are, actively choose to do that to, because they're knowledgeable and aware, and, but there's a lot of people in the middle who may still you know, have to overcome some of these stigmas and how do we as public health researchers and planners and making them cool <laughs> to ride a bus. Um, like I'm a hipster, I ride the bus, not, you know, I don't have any other way to, everyone's gonna think that I you know, can't afford a car you know, or something. So these are things, these are all psychological perspective, uh, also um, at the bottom, I was thinking about this a lot, you know. So there's other factors that go into these utility decisions um, uh, that uh, make potentially that we have to overcome when we try to get um, promote um, active transit, personal comforts and practicality to auto transit. And I really felt some of these when I walked a lot in D.C. And I'm glad I did this, but carrying a, a heavy backpack. Um, with a laptop and, and all and, and extra clothes because I was sweating so much getting <laughs> to my job and then I had to change. This is a lot of stuff to carry and then what if I wanted to go somewhere right after work? That means I had to carry all the same stuff there. So there's a lot to carry. I thought, oh, you know, I forgot. I didn't realize if you have a car, you just throw it all in the trunk and then you just go to you go somewhere after work and just throw it all. You don't have to carry it in to happy hour, you know, and carry this huge backpack in. So this is, you know, these are things that do affect our decisions, and we need to think about these things. Um, climate control, now in Southern California, maybe it's more of a heat issue, but it is hot, especially the past two months, to bike and to walk. It's much, you know, you can control the climate in your car. It's a big issue where I'm from in Minnesota. You know, nine months of the year, I feel like it's snowing or raining, so what do we do? And, there, and I'm not saying, and then obviously, you, when you're in your car, you have, you can put your the music, on, whatever, you listen to music, you want to listen to NPR, you can have um, the radio, you have this climate that's just you and your time, and you can have your, so, your coffee in your cup, and you can, don't have to carry it with everything else and walk down the street. So how do we deal with that? And I don't think these are insurmountable. I think these are things that you can do um, to... Uh, uh, modify your environment. You know, you, we, so for example, I, in, you can have more public lockers places near transit stops. You can have lockers even just in retail areas. So people that are walking can put a bunch of stuff in their locker and walk around if they walked, you know, and then get it before they leave. You know, we don't think about these. You can have, you could have carts that people from grocery stores could, could maybe borrow <laughs> instead of having wheels that lock, you know, so they think you're going to steal it when you get out of the Target parking lot. Um, you could have um, covered walkways for pedestrians. You could have um, skyways. Minneapolis, where I'm from, skyways everywhere. People walk all over. It's freezing cold, but you walk through the skyway underground. Ways to get around the elements. So there's things we can do. We just need to think about them. Um, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here because I, don't, I, don't I want to leave time for questions. These are just some more um, uh, thought-provoking pr thought topics about types of interventions. But I know we only have about five minutes left, so um, I'm going pa to pause here and open it up so we can have questions uh, for Dr. Handy. Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Handy. Um, you, you pretty much nailed down three issues uh, in terms of health and planning, um, safety, pollution, and physical activity. And uh, maybe you can answer this, but this is something that I'm um, struggling with. So um, in public policy and planning, there's a dilemma. Um, so the physical activity and you know, safety and air pollution, they can't go together. Because, I mean, um, if you promote physical activity through walking and biking, taking more transit, you're naturally pushing more people out to the streets in urban areas, especially. And um, it, unless you, 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 you have a critical mass um, to, to shift modes from auto uh, to uh, biking or walking, you're not going to be able to achieve a whole lot of reduction in safety uh, or in pollution or improve safety. So there's a dilemma in terms of you know pushing these all three things together, and um, I'm just wondering how I, you know how how you 
how you would deal with these issues and how you resolve these you know, conflicts between different policies. Yeah, well, so I really did gloss over that because if you, know, if you, if you jump ahead and say you, know, you, you get enough of a shift, then the problem goes away, right? So you, you, you know, like the Netherlands and, and Denmark, you know, they have so much walking and biking. Okay, so my question, how do you, you know, yeah, uh, push so this, you know, the positive to a positive feedback loop to be able to, you know. Well, I think, um, I think you just do it. But, you know, there is that, um, you know, what you're pointing out is that there is some risk along the way, right? So if you go to, you go push people to walk and bike more for some period of time, that may actually be worse for health because safety has not yet improved until you get to the critical mass. Um, so I don't know, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but I guess I do believe that, uh, you know, in the long run, it's all justified, and that that it really is all synergistic. You, you know, that by promoting um, active travel for physical health reasons, you're also helping with the safety issue and you're helping with the air quality issue. And if you do things to help with the safety issue, that's going to help active travel. If you do things to help with the pollution issue, that's going to help, help with active travel. So um, I think there is some short run conflict, but not long run. And I don't, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I just ignored the short run. I don't have the answer. Free <laughs> and, then, and then you. Yeah. Um, Dr. Haney, I found it very interesting that um, the data you presented about bicycling incidents happening a lot more in smaller cities, especially where there's a university. Um, I'm from one of those cities, Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, which has a very similar demographic, I would say. Um, and so my question for you is what role do you think the university has played, like in Davis, for example? Um, how do you find that, A, they have contributed to that directly or any strategies that, that you might uh, see? Yeah, so it's the, the level of bicycling is higher in these places. Uh, the university is a very important part of the story in Davis, even going back to the you know, the president of the university in the late 50s who said, this is going to be a bicycle campus. And he told all the freshmen to come with a bicycle because <laughs> it was such a low density spread out place. Uh, and then the town came along sort of after that. So in that case, it really was the university pushing it. Um, but if you think about it, you know, the university is really doing everything I said we needed to do, right? So they make it possible because they're bike paths and bike parking and all of that. Um, they make it, uh, what was the second thing? Uh, people know about it was the second thing. And they make it more attractive uh, primarily through parking policy because parking is inconvenient. So if you do drive, you know, you're parking way at the edge of campus and you have to walk. And that's a lot slower than if you just biked all the way to your building. And because you have to pay for parking is another deterrent to driving. So. Um, that's the nice thing about campuses, is that we do so much more of that kind of deterrent to driving than we do almost anywhere, anywhere else. And that helps to explain why there's so much bicycling in those places. And of course, it's the young population, and young poor population <laughs> <laughs> uh, as well. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so like with kind of related to what Dr. Benton was saying with you know voluntary voluntary uh, physical activity and all that kind of stuff, uh, there's you know there's this sort of artificial stratification of you know people moving to places like like you know like when people are done with schooling or like when, when they want to move to a place they'll be like oh well I want to move to Portland or I want to move to Boulder or you know I want to move to these places that have bikes and I, I want to do this because I am physically active. So do you see this artificial like stratification as a positive thing or a negative thing? I mean, is people are these people like moving out of like, you know, like non uh, like unhealthy areas that are very auto fueled and into healthy cities and not, you know, you're you're sucking all the energy sort of <laughs> out of out of these cities that really need those people. Ah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't thought That's about really it that way. It's a brain drain, but it's kind of like a brain drain-ish. Yeah, <laughs> Health, healthy people I think, drain. <laughs> I think what's happening, at least on the bicycling front, is you know Portland is so hip and popular mm -hmm. that you know. It, that's spilling over to other cities that say, look, if we want to keep this young, educated population, we've got to 
provide some of that as well. So LA, you know, investing in its bicycle program and lots of other cities doing the same thing. So I think, you know, maybe I hadn't thought about that migration issue, mm -hmm. but I think the, the, you know, then there's kind of the spillover of the success to other places that are trying to emulate it. Um, the voluntary thing was a very interesting question that uh, I do think needs some more thought. Um, yeah, if it is so much, you know, if it's more desirable when it is voluntary, and the less voluntary we make it, the less desirable it becomes. So I need, I need to think about that in the research we're doing. Uh, another thought about that. But I think also this, you know, in conjunction with that and this question about people moving, one thing, one study I'm really interested in doing is finding UC Davis graduates and surveying them. Mm -hmm. I just need to talk to the Alumni Association, mm -hmm. I think. That's but a good uh, both about where they're choosing to live uh, and do they think about bicycling when they're choosing where to live? And then when they get there, are they bicycling more than everybody else because of that experience as a UC Davis student mm -hmm. when they were you know, regularly bicycling? So again, it's this question about where do, where do people's attitudes and preferences mm -hmm. come from? And mm -hmm. how, does, how do they develop? And how does your experience in a particular place where it's either good or bad for right. active travel, how does that then carry over to, to later points in life. I think that's, that's a really interesting question. Yeah. So um, we heard a lot about externalities and about the cost to society, to the nation, to, to society for driving, from driving and not walking and, and, and biking in transit. And yet we don't seem to have the political will to take those costs and quantify them explicitly and put them on the table. We know that the fuel taxes are paying for the roads that are being built. Um, and, and they're not even enough to, to keep up the upgrade. Leave alone to take care of all of these externality costs that need to be quantified. When are we willing to start putting down tolls? We have the technology to do boothless tolls. Now, granted, people are worried that the government's going to track them down or whatever. But, but the reality is, is that I think people still, and this would be a research question, I suppose, I don't know the answer. But I think if you ask someone, what is more socialist, transit, biking, walking, or, or versus driving, they would say those other three. And they would say, you know, the great American <laughs> industry, capitalism, you know, when it is socialist. Anyone buy a de buying a communist definition where roads can be used as much as you want, and we all pay the same, a aside from the fuel tax, which isn't enough. So when are we willing to start talking about this in those terms? Because if you did that, I think, you would probably see a behavioral shift fairly quickly. And you would not have the stigma. You would not have any of these issues that we're talking about. And we saw, we see a lot of that with, t I mean, tobacco policy, especially in California and other states, as being, you know, I mean, it's a different, it's a similar but different issue because it doesn't, it affects, uh, it initially even affected a smaller proportion of people than driving, you know. Mm -hmm. It started a small proportion and became much smaller, but we do see a lot of success in that area, which was imposing tax restrictions, bans on in certain areas, you know, not overly popular for those that it affected, but it helped to maybe address some of those, some externalities as well as the personal health issues. So that's just a thought, but it's, a, it's obviously a different issue because you started at 25% and went down to 14%, not starting at 92%, or 99% yeah. <laughs> and try, uh, right, affected everybody. Right. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I wish I knew yeah. the answer to your no. question. But we do, um, uh, people have quantified those externalities. One of my colleagues at UC Davis has this huge report that put all those numbers together some years ago, but um, it's probably still pretty much right. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think you know we know what those costs are, and then the question is, how could we ever impose that? You know, the political will to do that. But um, study out of San Jose State, Asha Agrawal, Weinstein, or Weinstein Agrawal, uh, did some surveying in California about people's willingness to pay more, and found, in fact, there there did seem to be. You know, at least people say in the survey that you know, if the money gets used this way, yes, they could see uh, that a, an increase in the gas tax or other forms of pricing would be a good thing. Um, so there may be more political support for it than the political leaders 
understand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're just not willing to do it.